Good morning. Good morning, church. Welcome to Florida. I'm, I am from Memphis now, if, so I'm used to this. And by the way, if you're from Memphis, you don't say the second M and nobody knows why. Uh, but that's my home territory, born and raised in Memphis. This is the kind of weather I grew up in and, uh, and played in as a kid. So uh, I've, I'm feeling uh, like I'm home this morning. Well, our normal, normal pulpit has about three or four clocks in it. Uh, you know, no, no one ever looks at them, but uh, they're there for us, and so I'm going to take my watch off so I can uh, be aware of the time. I will on occasion look at it. Well, we had a business meeting with great success and great unity uh, today, and uh, you know, business meetings, uh, uh, sometimes they might be just a little inconvenient, but keep in mind the churches that aren't growing, churches that aren't building and buying into the future, churches that aren't embracing ventures of faith rarely have business meetings. And uh, it really didn't hurt, did it, that they threw donuts in? I don't know whose idea that was, but I am so thankful. It sounded like something Austin. Yeah, that, that's okay. <laughs> Thank you, Austin, for that. I my first thought when I got up out of bed this morning was, wow, I get to, I get to preach today. My second thought was, I get to have a donut today. <laughs> and I had one, and it was good, and I really, really appreciate it. You know, I got a strange thing with donuts. I can walk right by a cookie and just leave it there, and I can dismiss a piece of cake or pie, but I'm telling you, a donut will get me every single time. I should have been a cop. I love donuts so much. <laughs> when I, when I uh, lay eyes on a glazed donut with chocolate icing, I am immediately overcome by multiple involuntary physiological reactions. I'd never go into a donut shop. I know, I know better than to do that. I, I'll go in and say, I'll take three dozen. Oh, you having a party? No, just me. <laughs> so thank you, thank you so much for the donuts. Uh, you've kind of made my day, and I get to preach now off of a sugar high. So I better hurry up before that sugar high leaves me with a corresponding low. Well, from the ridiculous to the sublime, if you would, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, as we continue our sermon series through 1 Corinthians, We've made our way to the 11th chapter, and we've come to what is uh, uh, known as that communion portion of Paul's letter to the Corinthians. But we want to see that uh, the Lord's Supper in its context. Uh, context, 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 always important in the Bible. We're going back to verse 17 of chapter 11, 1 Corinthians. Paul says in the following directives, I've underlined that phrase, following directives. I've also underlined um, the last phrase of the chapter, further directions. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt, there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. 
saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, and he's already presented what that unworthy manner is, will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord, and I think he's talking about the body of Christ, the church, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Verse 30, that is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have have fallen asleep, which is the Christian terminology for, for death. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we're being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And when I come, I will give further directions. Oh, so many sermons begging to be preached in this passage. But this morning, uh, I want to look at it perhaps a little differently than what you've heard. It's great to be together. I see every Sunday as a privileged setting, filled with blessing and amazing potential. I'm convinced there are blessings in abundance that are flowing even this morning if you and I will just have eyes to see them. However, there have been times when it wasn't so great for the church to come together, when it actually did more harm than good. And that is the background, the context, the impetus behind Paul's words in this chapter. Leave it to the Corinthians. They had the ability to take something that should have been exceedingly positive and turn it into something that was downright destructive. They knew how to take the holy and make it harmful. It's amazing that Christians can get so far off the track, so far they can't even hear the train. And the Corinthian church had done that. It was time for an intervention, an apostolic intervention. And Paul very simply speaks of two things here. First of all, he speaks of when you come together. You'll see that phrase four times in the text we've read this morning. If you look, verse 18, in the first place I hear that when you come together as a church. Verse 20, when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. Verse 33, so then my brothers, when you come together, and again in verse 34, If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. Now, at the first reading of this chapter, I was snagged by this four-pronged hook, and it wouldn't let me go. I wanted to be free from it. I wanted to move on to other things in this chapter, but that kept calling me back, and so finally I gave up. I'm a little slow, a little thick, but finally I had the good sense to give up because I knew I wasn't going to have any peace until I explored those words and incorporated them into this message today. After all, Paul incorporated them in this chapter. He surrounded the Lord's Supper with these words. And this, by the way, is the agony and ecstasy of sermon preparation. If you haven't done that for 50 years, week after week, you really don't know what you're missing. So why does Paul give such emphasis to our coming together? Because it is a big deal. That's why. Because it's that important. Because he knows that the potential he knows the potential of when we come together. He knows that when we come together, 
amazing things can happen. When we come together in chapter 12, prophecies can be given. Healings can take place. Miracles can happen. When we come together in chapter 13, love can be demonstrated. When we come together in chapter 14, throughout that chapter, the church can be edified. Now, as I've mentioned in all of my 1 Corinthian sermons, I found it very, very helpful to read and study 1 Corinthians in the light of chapter 1 in 1 Corinthians, where Paul draws this comparison between the world's wisdom and the wisdom of God. That comparison blankets the whole book. It's in place and it holds throughout 1 Corinthians. And when it comes to our coming together, well, the world certainly has its wisdom about that. It's got its ideas about you and me coming together, even this morning. Most of them think, what a waste. Look at the Kool-Aid drinkers. What could they possibly get from sitting in a church service? Well, maybe not very much if they're just sitting in a church service. But if the people are engaged, if they are participating, they can get a lot out of a church service. In fact, they can get something in a moment that will change every moment that follows it. They can get some things this world could never offer. And this world would never be able to take away. They can get grace and peace and joy and hope. They can get revelation and inspiration. And the world has no concept of any of that. They have no appreciation for the things of God because as Paul lays out in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the natural man, the unconverted man, cannot perceive, he cannot understand he cannot grasp the things of God because they're foolishness to him so that's right God's wisdom is foolishness to the world so the world will never stand up and acknowledge or applaud your Bible reading or your witnessing or your prayer life or your church attendance or even your moral values because they operate out of the world's wisdom, which is not wisdom at all, and in fact is contrary to the wisdom of God. Have you felt that rub? Have you experienced that tension? If so, that's probably a good sign. If not, hey, you might want to reevaluate some things. But Paul sees it differently from the world, and we see it like Paul does. He says, when you come together, when you come together in God's presence, when you come together in the presence of God's people, when you come together to worship the Father and call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you come together and do what you do, when you come together and sing as only, only you can sing, when you come together to hear the words of God, when you come to fellowship with those of like precious faith, oh, when you come together, the potential for good is off the charts. But it's not just enough that you come together. It's not enough that you have your meetings. When you come together is important, but it's also just as important how you come together. And that's the second part of this passage. That's the second part of this message. Not only when you come together, but how you come together. Now, the Corinthians, they had the first part down, no problem. They were doing just fine coming together. Uh, they had no rebuke from the apostle about their lack of coming together. When you come together was a way of life. But how they were coming together was the problem. 
And they had fallen into a pattern of bad behaviors, and that earned an apostolic rebuke. And it begins in verse 17, and it doesn't really stop until the end, and it doesn't even stop there, because in verse 17, Paul begins with what he calls the following directives, and ends, but doesn't end, in verse 34, with what he calls further directions. When I come, I will give you further directions. In other words, this is what I have for you right now, but I'm not done with you yet. There's a lot more to be said. These following directives are all I can give you until the further directions I want to give you in person. So we don't get to hear everything Paul has to say, but I think we hear plenty. I think we hear enough to see how upset he is, to learn that the Corinthians were on a wrong path. And Paul uh, refuses to let that go unaddressed because that path led to a very unhealthy church. In fact, a church that had sickness and even death because of it. So here is the apostles' appraisal of their coming together. And just a forewarning, <laughs> it, it's not good. It's, it's not pretty. It's not what it should be. In fact, quite the opposite. Listen to what the apostle says in verse 17. He says, your meetings do more harm than good. I've been in meetings like that. Yeah. He said in verse 18, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. In verse 19, he says, no doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. Paul is speaking with sarcasm. Oh, you just have to be different, don't you? So you can stand out, so you can get one up on everybody else, so you can show everybody how enlightened you are. And it's all manufactured and motivated by pride. In verse 20, when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. It has the pretense of the Lord's Supper. You may call it the Lord's Supper, but it's not the Lord's Supper. It's not the real thing. It's not even close. And perhaps the low point of the chapter is in verse 22. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. So think of it now. They are so insensitive, so calloused, so self-absorbed, they end up humiliating others who are in the same church, in the same room, at the same table, at the same time, who have nothing. And while some are hungry, they're slamming down sloppy joes and potato chips, as only church people can do. I, there have been people killed at church food lines, <laughs> elbowed to death. And some had so much, while others had so little. There's no sin in having much or in having little. The sin comes when those who have so much turn a blind eye to those who have so little. So this is not going well. As I'm not talking about the sermon. I'm talking about Paul's communication. I'm, I'm talking about the Corinthians, not you suffering. It's not going well. I mean, how would you describe Paul's mood? When I study the Bible, I'm always interested in mood, atmosphere. Well, man, I'd say he's upset. I'd say he's disappointed. In fact, I, I think you could rightly say even angry. And it's clear he didn't say everything he wanted to say because he wanted to say it in person. So now he gives them verse 17, the following directives. And in verse 34, when I come, I will give you further directives. So he's telling them, I have plenty more to say to you. I plan on saying it, when I, but I want to be there. I want to be there in person. I want you to see, the, I want you to hear the passion in my voice. 
I want you to see this furrowed brow. I want you to see the dilated pupils of my eyes. I want you to see the veins popping in my neck and the smoke coming out of my ears. I want you to understand how serious this is. So he says, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, and then when I get there, I'm going to tell you some more. And then when I, what I find really interesting here is that he really didn't tell them much. There really isn't a lot of directives or direction Paul is very, very short on teaching or exhortation. But what he does is a genius, an act of genius. He, what he does is he gives them an example to think about, an image, a picture worth more than a thousand words. He reviews for them the very powerful images and actions of the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed. Paul showcases Jesus to remind them of what love looks like, how love conducts itself. He directs their thoughts to the one who is our example, our Savior and our Lord. And Paul is saying, Look at him, and what do you see? You see grace, gratitude, servanthood, sacrifice. You hear him. This is my body given for you. This is my blood poured out for you. And look at yourselves, and what do you see? Do you see grace, servanthood, sacrifice, gratitude? No, You see selfishness and greed and pride. In fact, you see those things in the very context of communion, the commemoration of the Lord's Supper and sacrifice for us all. It's like, how can you be so calloused and so clueless? Your behavior is so far removed from the Lord you're claiming to be in communion with that takes one's breath away. Your behavior doesn't reflect the love of God. It doesn't represent the spirit and sacrifice of His Son. Somehow, somewhere, you've lost that. And at the very time and at the very place, it should be obvious, it should be evident in every mood. And every motion of your so-called love feast, it's non-existent. Why with the cup before you and the bread in your hands, you humiliate your brothers and sisters, the ones for whom Christ suffered and died, those who make up the church, yes, the body of Christ. And as you remember his love and sacrifice for others, You think only of yourselves. You eat this bread and drink this cup in an unworthy manner. Now, if you're like me, uh, you probably looked at that and you wondered, how how could this happen? How could this be? How how could they be so self-absorbed, so self-centered? But really, doesn't it happen all the time? Just look at the way people drive. How about that guy that takes up two parking spots? Clueless. Uh, I am the world's worst parker. I take up two parking spots, but then I back up about three times and pull in so that it looks sort of acceptable. And it reminds me of the lady driving behind a person, another lady who was, well, she was just too slow for her because this lady was important and she had things to do and places to go. And when the lady in front of her stopped at a crosswalk on a yellow light like she should have done, well, it really set this lady off. I mean, she was hostile, aggressive. She hit the horn, she yelled, and she waved her arms. And when the light turned green, just in case the lady in front of her hadn't got the message, she sped around her and gave her another gesture to make sure she got the message. 
And a patrolman was over to the side, and he was watching all of this, uh, no doubt, you know, eating a donut and watching all of this. <laughs> and so he stopped her, and she didn't hesitate to express her anger toward him. Why did you pull me over? Well, ma'am, he said, I saw the follow me to Sunday school sticker on the one side of your bumper. On the other side of the bumper, I noticed there was a what would Jesus do speaker, uh, sticker. And then in between, there was this chrome-plated fish symbol. So I assumed the car had to be stolen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sometimes Christians don't act like Christians behind the wheel of a car, maybe even in church. And it's something that every one of us have to face, has to fight all the time. It's because it's, it's part of our human nature. Before we were out of the high chair, we learned to say, mine. And we spend our lives saying, me, mine us, us four, no more. And it's a fact that we humans can drift into this selfishness and be so selfish and so clueless about our selfishness. Why, the, the Christians in Corinth were divided over things that should have united them. They were suing one another utilizing the services of Hupi and Abraham, I'm sure. <laughs> they were abusing their freedoms. They were even inconsiderate in the way they exercised spiritual gifts. And they were showing the worst selfishness of all at the Lord's table. They were acting just like the world they had been called out of. Was Paul upset? Absolutely. Should he have been? Absolutely. So Paul brings them back, back to Jesus, back to the demonstration of his love, back to his body and his blood. His body, his blood, his sacrifice show you the way. They show you how to treat one another. They show you how to be a healthy church. They show you how to live. So the self-centered church is a sick church, and it's not serving its Lord, it's not serving one another, and it's dying instead of pulsating with the life and love of Jesus. And Paul says, the answer for you is to look at him. Hmm. The answer for all of us <laughs> is to look at Him. When we look at Him, we learn what we should be. And when we look to Him, we learn what we can be. I walked away from this passage, this message with a prayer. Oh, Lord. Help us to be more like your son. Let's pray. Father, it's so easy for us just to go along with what is routine in the world, but can never be routine in your church. Forgive us when we have been so self-preoccupied, so selfish, so lacking in thoughtfulness and generosity, kindness and servanthood and humility. Lord, bring us back. Bring us back to Jesus. Bring us back to the fact of all he was and all he is. And bring us back to the fact that He has changed us, called us, that we might be conformed into His image, His likeness. 
that we might show the world our Jesus. And not just the world, but our families and our churches. We know it's a mission impossible. We can't do it without you, Lord. We have enough evidence that we can't, can't deny that. We have enough failure. We have enough shortcoming in our life that we can't deny that. And so we pray for all that is good and all that is right and all that is holy to come to us. We pray for spirit and word to be released in our lives, to take us places where we conveniently overlook, to take us places where in our humanity we don't want to go, but take us to places where we must go to give up our pride, our selfishness, and to take on the Spirit of Jesus in all we do and all we are. Our men are going to come and they're going to serve us the Lord's Supper. And let's take these holy moments to be in God's presence. Paul said, before a man eat that bread and drink that cup, let a man examine himself. In the light of God's Word, in the light of this incredible teaching context of the Lord's Supper, let's examine ourselves today. And if there's weakness, if there are, and if you're like me, oh, you don't have to look very long or very far. There are glaring weaknesses. Let's just lift those up to the Lord and say, Lord, I see it. I want to cooperate with you in this process of transformation, sanctification in my life. God bless you.